Hi everyone, uh, it's Raphael. Uh, we are here today uh, with Srinas Seti presenting Baby Spartan. Uh, Srinas is working at Microsoft Research and has worked on a very valuable computation for quite a long time. Uh, I am very excited and I hope you are too about this talk. So, thank, so let's first uh, thank Srinas uh, for being here and uh, let's take notes, uh, ask questions. And yeah, thanks again. Uh, thanks, so thanks, thanks, Rafael. Thank you all for joining. Uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to present uh, Baby Spartan in this forum. Uh, so in a nutshell, Baby Spartan is a, a new snark and it targets non-uniform computation. Uh, by non-uniform computation, uh, hopefully it becomes more clear through the talk, but it, it refers to computation that does not have any particular structure. So it could be completely unstructured circuits. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Justin Taylor, and uh, we posted this on ePrint uh, uh, late last year, and it's linked from this slide here. Uh, so let, let me start with a quick overview of uh, how Baby Spartan relates to some of the other papers. Uh, 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 so uh, so Baby Spartan, uh, as I said, is a non it it focuses on non uniform computation. Uh, so it it depends on uh, uh, this prior system that we also described in a different ePrint called Lasso, uh, which in turn depends on an earlier work called Spartan. Uh, Spartan itself is described in a bunch of papers uh, going back all the way to 2019. Uh, so in a nutshell, Spartan is a snark uh, that gave logarithmic proof sizes and one uh, polynomial evaluation argument. So what Lasso did was it took Spartan and factored out a lookup argument from it. And one of the key properties of Lasso is that uh, it only commits to small field elements. By small field elements, I mean uh, the bit width of the uh, uh, elements is small, it's much smaller than the total bit width of the field elements, uh, meaning that uh, the set of elements that it commits to are from a small subset of the entire finite field. So if you're working with the two to six bit fields, uh, the bit width of the field elements committed could be 16 or 32, like it's much smaller than the total field size. I'll, I'll explain why this matters. Uh, so then there is another paper called Jolt, which you might be familiar with, which is a snark for proving VM executions. And this is based on Lasso. Uh, so we can think of this uh, uh, VM executions as a, sort of a uniform computation because there is a, uh, a the same computation proven for every cycle of the virtual machine. Uh, so Baby Spartan sort of um, uh, is an uh, is uh, is complementary to Jolt in the sense it achieves the same property as Jolt, but for non-uniform computation. Uh, as I'll as I'll show later, it it's a it's a pretty straightforward combination of Lasso and Spartan protocols. Um, so let me go to uh, the next slide. Okay, so so uh, and um, uh, Baby Spartan targets uh, punkish constraint systems, uh, and in particular, it provides uh, what's called a new uh, a polynomial IOP, and then. One can take this polynomial IOP combined with any existing uh, multilinear polynomial commitment scheme to get a snark. And uh, 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 one of the key advances, like I uh, alluded to earlier, is that the prover only commits to small field elements if the witness contains uh, small field elements. And this is in contrast with uh, other proof systems for Planckish, like Planck and Hyperplonk where the provers actually commit to random field elements, even if the witness contains only small field elements. Uh, even if the, uh, the witness has 16-bit field elements, the proof system requires, as part of the proof system, to commit to some vectors where the elements are random from the entire finite field. There is another paper that was posted uh, uh, around the same time as Baby Spartan. That also shows how Lasso can be used to unlock the same advance uh, for the case of Hyperplonk. Uh, and I think the, the two systems are very similar, except uh, we focus on uh, using Spartan, whereas uh, uh, this other paper by Diamond and Poussin uses Hyperplonk, which is more suitable for their setting. 
So uh, I alluded to this uh, property of uh, uh, committing to small field elements. Uh, why is this actually important? First, uh, for if you look at many real world circuits, uh, and if you look at the witness elements, uh, many of them are much smaller than the field, uh, the total size of the field. For, uh, this includes uh, uh, circuits like ZK email, ZK login, where uh, uh, the circuit actually verifies hash evaluations like SHA-256 evaluations and RSA signature verification. And uh, many of these deal with uh, a small bit. Uh, 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 as part of the circuit, if you look at the bit width of the witness elements, they turn out to be much smaller than the size of the field. Uh, so the other uh, reason why this uh, property is important is because in many polynomial commitment schemes, the cost to create a commitment depends on the bit width of the scalars or the bit width of these uh, witness elements. Uh, this includes uh, many uh, popular polynomial commitment schemes like KZG, variants of KZG, like uh, KZG plus Gemini, Zeromorph, Dory, Hyrax, Sona, and even the uh, newest uh, polynomial commitment scheme like Binius. And uh, because of this, uh, committing to small uh, scalars or field elements is much cheaper than committing to random scalars. And uh, one uh, small example to illustrate this is uh, if we look at computing uh, g power 2 to the 16, where the exponent is a, a small 16-bit number, is 10 times cheaper than computing g power 2 to the 1, 160. One of them just requires 16 operations. The other requires like 160 operations. There is a more uh, detailed discussion of why uh, 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 there is a there is a detailed discussion of this point in the Lasso and Joel paper. So I'll not focus on uh, uh, providing more details of this uh, point. Um, so uh, first, uh, I'll start. So the rest of this talk is uh, organized in two parts. First, I'll describe uh, some background on modern snark design which will be useful for describing baby Spartan. And then I'll describe baby Spartan. And uh, if time permits and people have questions, I'm happy to go over the paper and then answer any questions or dig deeper beyond the slide deck. Are there any questions so far? Um, I think they are all good. I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Sounds good. So let me start with this background on modern snark design. So just to recap snark, I'll, I'll just do a quick run through of these next few slides. It just introduces some terminology that will be helpful later on. Uh, so snark has a prover and a verifier and the prover sends a proof to the verifier. And it's a proof establishing the knowledge of some witness to some statement. And the statement could be as simple as, I know a witness X such that SHA-256 applied to this witness results in some public value y, or it could be more general. For example, the prover proves that it knows a witness w such that the circuit applied to w and some x, where x is the public input, makes the circuit output one. Um, a trivial proof system is one in which the prover just sends the witness and the verifier checks. Uh, compared to this trivial proof system, we want a snark that has much better properties. For example, the size of the proof is much smaller than the size of the witness and the size of the statement proven. For example, we want uh, a proof size to be exponentially smaller. Uh, so this is captured by requiring the proof size to be polylogarithmic. And the cost to verify proof should also be similarly smaller than the cost to check the witness. So in the modern snarks, including uh, uh, baby Spartan, it's constructed with this uh, simple recipe where there is a polynomial IOP and it's combined with a polynomial commitment scheme. And this uh, sort of gives a very modular design for snarks because one can take a, a polynomial IOP combined with any different polynomial commitment schemes to get different properties. Or you can take a polynomial commitment scheme and then find a different polynomial IOP to suit your needs and get a snark. Uh, so this combination gives uh, a succinct interactive argument of knowledge, and it's then made non-interactive using the fiat shamir transformation. There are some uh, 
some exceptions uh, to this general recipe. Uh, most notably, this includes uh, things like uh, linear PCP-based SNARKs like Growth16 or folding scheme-based SNARKs like NOAA. They follow a slightly different recipe, but for the purpose of this talk, it's uh, enough to focus on this general recipe. So just to uh, dig a little bit deeper, so uh, I'm going to uh, introduce this polynomial IOP, uh, uh, and I'm going to focus on the circuit satisfiability. So here, the, the prover sends a polynomial in each round, and the verifier uh, uh, can evaluate this polynomial at a point in its domain, and then uh, the prover uh, and then the verifier uh, runs some check at the end of the protocol based on this um, uh, based on this check it outputs a bit whether it accepts this messages that the prover sent or not and there are standard notions of uh, completeness knowledge soundness just like in snarks that can be defined for a polynomial IP and then one can also use pre-processing so that the verifier does not have to read the description of the circuit in the uh, last step of this protocol. So the other primitive that we are going to use is a polynomial commitment scheme. So here the prover has some polynomial G and it sends a, a commitment to this polynomial by sending this message C. Then the verifier can ask for an evaluation of this committed polynomial at some point R. The prover sends uh, a value V and a proof pi. And then the verifier checks, runs a check using the commitment, the point at which the polynomial is evaluated, the value provided by the prover along with the proof, and then it outputs a bit. And one uh, uh, important property here is that uh, the commitments are short and the proof verification is quick. It turns out uh, uh, this polynomial commitment schema is, it can be thought of as a special purpose snark. So it has standard notions of completeness, extractability, and so on. Turns out this is exactly the combination that we need, uh, where we have a polynomial IOP where the prover would send polynomials. Instead, uh, uh, we would have the prover send a commitment to those polynomials. Uh, so in, uh, instead of sending them Mess, uh, full polynomial, it sends a commitment to those polynomials in each round. And then instead of the verifier evaluating those polynomials, the prover provides an evaluation along with some proof. And then uh, the verifier just checks these uh, final predicate by using those evaluations along with the proofs provided. It outputs a, a Boolean. And then we can obviously make this uh, non-interactive using the fiat Shamir transformation giving us a snark. So this is the general recipe that we are going to use. And the main thing that we are going to do is uh, we're going to design a new polynomial IOP. Are there any questions in the chat? Uh, we have a question that's uh, for the end and not, not just yet. We are all good right now. Sounds good. So, so far I've given a general recipe, which is also followed by Baby Spartan. So now let me jump into what Baby Spartan is and how it's constructed. So let's, uh, okay. So, so as I said, it's uh, it follows this general recipe I presented in the last few slides. So there is a polynomial IP uh, and it requires a particular type of uh, polynomial commitment scheme that's applied to so-called multilinear polynomials. This is because um, the polynomials that are sent in the polynomial IOP are going to be multilinear polynomials. And there are many existing uh, uh, schemes that apply to multilinear polynomials, uh, like Zeromorph, Irax, Dory, Sona, Binius. They all have different uh, properties. So uh, they all have different performance characteristics. So when you take a, a, a polynomial commitment scheme combined with baby Spartan, you can get different properties. And on the polynomial IOP itself, as I'll show you soon, it, it turns out to be a straight combination of uh, uh, Spartan and Lasso. So let me go a little bit deeper into how uh, baby Spartan relates to Spartan itself. So, uh, uh, so Spartan itself was originally described for this arithmetization called R1CS. Uh, but recently we showed that uh, the same uh, polynomial IOP also applies to Plonkish and 
air, uh, which are typically used in Planck and Stark-based proof systems, respectively. In fact, uh, we show uh, Spartan applies to a generalization of all these arithmetizations called CCS, which stands for Customizable Constraint Systems. So for uh, it turns out that uh, for uniform circuits, for example, if the circuit contains a um, uh, lot of repeated copies of the same sub-circuit, uh, this shows up if your circuit is data parallel, or it also shows up if your circuit is uh, this algebraic intermediate representation or air. Uh, it turns out that the Spartan, the prover just commits to the witness. Uh, what this means is that if the witness contains only small field elements, the prover only commits to small field elements. So for uniform circuits, um, uh, Spartan already has this property that uh, uh, the prover only commits to small field elements. But if you focus on non-uniform circuits where there is no structure in the circuit, like it's completely arbitrary, it turns out uh, the prover does commit to random field elements, just like how Planck or Hyperplonk uh, also had this uh, downside. So baby Spartan was designed to exactly address this problem where uh, even for non-uniform circuits, circuits which have no structure, we want the prover to only commit to elements from the witness. And if the witness contains small field elements, the prover's commitment cost is also proportional to committing to small field elements. And we pretty much follow the same blueprint as Spartan's IOP. Uh, the main difference between Spartan and baby Spartan is that it's going to use this lookup argument called lasso to prove a linear constraints. I'll, I'll, it will become more clear what I mean by linear constraints. Um, and um, so the uh, the overall result is that even when we have non-uniform circuits, circuits have no structure, the prover ends up committing only to small field elements. So let's see how this is achieved. So in the paper, we describe uh, uh, baby Spartan for R1CS and CCS. Uh, in this talk, I have adapted the description to Planckish uh, as it may be more useful in practice. Uh, to uh, to be implemented in existing libraries. So I, I wrote this for this talk. We plan to put this in the paper, but for now, if you look at the talk and the paper, there is going to be a difference in descriptions. So uh, for this talk, I'm going to focus on what's called a vanilla Planckish circuit. Uh, for this is just for simplicity. One can easily extend this description to custom gates and also look up gates, but I'm completely going to ignore this because it's going to make my description much simpler. Uh, here in the vanilla Planckish circuit, I have a, a set of rows and a set of columns. Uh, and some of those columns has, uh, as you know, are pre-processed columns. These are columns that describe the circuit itself. Like these are so-called selectors. And there are then there are some witness columns. These are the inputs to the different gates and let n denote the number of gates in the circuit. And in vanilla Planckish, there are two sets of constraints. One is uh, these gate constraints that must apply, for, that must be satisfied for every row in this um, matrix. And uh, it's depicted by this equation. And this equation is essentially uh, emulating um, uh, an addition gate or a multiplication gate depending on the values of the selectors Q, M, uh, Q, L, Q, R, Q, O, and Q, C. And the requirement is that this polynomial evaluates to zero for every row of this matrix. And then there is uh, another set of uh, constraints which are so-called copy constraints. And the main, uh, the main uh, functionality of the copy constraints is to enforce equality between some cells of the witness columns. For example, if you want the second row uh, column B to have the same value as the third row column C, we are going to define uh, these copy constraints. And for the purpose of this presentation, I use this um, abstraction of a set. Uh, so what the set contains is, uh, it contains a, a set of indices, uh, I and J. So it's just a set of indices. Uh, 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 so it, uh, so the it's a set of elements where each element is a pair of indices. 
And what this uh, set uh, is enforcing is if we take concatenation of A, B, and C, which I've denoted with the letter Z, for every entry in the set, say for, a, for every I and J in the set, we want Z, uh, the value of Z at index I to match the value of uh, Z at index J. So this basically enforces uh, uh, particular requirements on uh, equality of cells in the uh, witness columns. Are there any questions? If not, I, I will go. So the next few slides sort of build on this. So if anyone has questions or comments about this, uh, please let me know. I think we are all good. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the way uh, we are going to, so we are, I'm going to uh, describe baby Spartan in two steps. First, I'll focus on proving these uh, so-called gate constraints. Then I'll focus on proving copy constraints. So proving gate constraints turns out to be exactly same as how Spartan proves gate constraints for R1CS. So what we are going to do is we are going to define a polynomial G uh, that is basically the constraint applied to every row of the Planckish um, trace or the Planckish matrix. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so the main requirement now is uh, translated to requirement on this polynomial. So we want this polynomial G to value to zero for I ranging from zero to one to N, uh, meaning every row of this matrix. So turns out that uh, uh, checking this polynomial G is zero for at n places is same as checking the sum, sum check equation. So except for a small soundness error, checking that G of I evaluates to zero for all the n locations is same as sampling a tau and then taking sum of evaluations of G uh, with the weights given by this special polynomial called EQ. So this is a special multilinear polynomial EQ. It's defined by this random value tau. And we evaluate this EQ at all the points uh, uh, from zero to uh, so one to N. And we uh, take the weighted sum between the two. And then we check if the weighted sum is zero. So now uh, here is the argument for proving uh, gate constraints. Turns out this is very similar to how Spartan proves gate constraints for R1CS. So the verifier in an offline uh, setup phase, it creates commitments to these uh, selector polynomials. So there is QM, QL, QR, and QO. These are the four selector polynomials. It's going to create a commitment. It retains commitments to those polynomials. So in the argument, in the first step, the prover sends commitments to polynomials, A, B, C. These are going to be multilinear polynomials, but for this description, it does not quite matter so much here. Uh, and then the, the verifier samples a random tau, sends it to the prover. In the third step, which is where all of the work happens, uh, the prover and the verifier run the sum check protocol. And what the sum check protocol does is it reduces the task of checking this uh, a zero equality over the entire hypercube to the task of checking the evaluation of G at a random point R. And this R is going to be picked during the course of the sum check protocol. And then what the verifier does is it uh, just uses the polynomial commitment scheme to query all the polynomials, uh, the polynomials that it holds in the setup phase and the polynomials that were sent in the first step and it queries all of them at R, and then it checks it, uh, checks the simple equation uh, at a random point. And if the if this check holds, the verifier accepts. If the check uh, fails, the verifier rejects. And this is all uh, that is necessary for checking gate constraints. So now that I've uh, described how baby Spartan proves gate constraints, now oh one more thing that I want to point here is like if you if you notice. Um, uh, the during the course of the sum check protocol, there are no additional commitments that are sent by the prover. And the only commitments that the prover sends are the commitments to these witness polynomials, A, B, and C. So if the witness has uh, small field elements, the prover ends up committing only to small field elements. So now let's see how we are going to prove baby, uh, so our baby Spartan proves uh, copy constraints. So recall we have a set S where the entries are a pair of indices. 
And for Z, which is a concatenation of all the witness columns, we want for every pair of indices in the set, we want the value at the index I to be the same as value at the index J. So suppose we have uh, M copy constraints. Um, and turns out proving them uh, is same as proving this uh, matrix equation. So for this, for the sake of this description, I'm going to use uh, two matrices, L and R. Turns out there is a, a way in which we can live with only one matrix, uh, which will give two X savings. But for the sake of this description, I'm going to use two matrices because it's much easier to describe. Uh, so what this, um, um, let, let me talk about what this matrix contains. Uh, so this matrix has M rows. Uh, one for each copy constraint. And uh, if you look at each row of these matrices, it's a unit vector, meaning uh, there's only one entry that is non-zero and that value is going to be one. Uh, so what it does is if you look at a particular copy constraint, it just, it's set to one at the in, let's say the copy constraint says I comma J, uh, and we are going to set the, uh, ith column of L to one for this copy constraint and the jth column of R to uh, one. So what it does is uh, if you do take the matrix vector product, uh, the left-hand side picks the ZI and the right-hand side picks the uh, ZJ. And then the equality enforces that ZI equals ZJ. So we have just translated from this uh, uh, set um, a formulation to a linear algebraic formulation. So uh, the reason this is very important is because uh, this is exactly the setting of lasso. Uh, and uh, uh, in lasso, what we do is uh, uh, it provides a lookup argument and every row of this sparse matrix picks a, an entry from this table. So in, in the lasso setting, Z is the table and L is basically specifying which entries of Z are picked. And uh, uh, by design, Lasso, by using offline memory checking, it only uh, commits to small field elements. So by using Lasso to prove this uh, uh, linear algebraic equality, uh, we end up also getting the same property of, uh, uh, same property where the prover only commits to small field elements. So in a bit more detail, um, uh, so for this description I gave, the verifier key uh, for the copy constraints is commitments to these polynomials, L and R. These are sparse polynomials. But in the case of Lasso, this is just commitments to two vectors of size M, where M is the number of copy constraints. So, uh, so in a bit more detail, let's say the set S consists of M copy constraints, I1, J1, I2, J2, so on up to I, M, J, M. So L is just this vector of indices on the left, I1, I2, so on up till I, M. And uh, sorry, I, there is a typo here. So it should say R, R, R is the vector of indices J1 through J, M. And these are the only two commitments that the verifier needs to keep in the offline uh, pre-processing phase. And this is in addition to commitments to the selector polynomials. So um, now to prove copy constraints, here is the argument. In practice, so this is going to run Lasso, which internally also runs the sum check protocol. In practice, what's going, what, what should be uh, done is uh, this sum check argument, a uh, sum check protocol should be batched with the sum check of the gate constraint. So to reduce the proof sizes. Uh, so what the verifier does is it's, it samples a random uh, beta. Uh, pro, uh, which is uh, of size log m, where m is the number of copy constraints. And then we run lasso to check this equality. And what this equality is checking is it uh, it basically checks the matrix, uh, the linear algebraic formulation that I showed in the last slide. Uh, so the, the let me go through the notation a little bit. Uh, so the L beta comma y uh, basically takes the weighted sum of all the rows of L uh, multiplies, so once we take the weighted sum of all the rows of L, we get a vector. We multiply that vector with Z. 
and then on the right hand side we again take the weighted sum of the rows of r with some evaluations of beta uh, and multiply that with z we get another value uh, we sum we basically take the inner product of the two vectors and we compare the two values and this is exactly the kind of um, uh, statement that lasso can prove very efficiently So in summary, uh, uh, so what Baby Spartan does is it can prove clonkish constraint systems without committing to random field elements. Turns out this is a straightforward combination of Spartan and Lasso. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier in the talk, Jolt shows how uh, to use Lasso for uniform computation. Uh, Baby Spartan does the exact same thing for non-uniform uh, computations like clonkish constraint systems. So these are all the slides that I had. So in the next part of this uh, uh, session, I can answer questions and also go through the paper to dig even deeper into the construction. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so we have one question. Uh, so I will just uh, repeat it. In recent months, people have used GKR for I guess the same reason, only commit to actually use bits. Uh, I would be interested. In, I would be interested in the trade-off between baby spartans and JKR-based lookups. Yes, yes. So I think um, so uh, by JKR lookup, I am assuming uh, people are might be referring to uh, uh, logup uh, that was based on JKR. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, so that protocol is almost the same as Lasso in many respects. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the Lasso paper came out, uh, I think, uh, so the main difference between Lasso and Logup is uh, Lasso commits to only small field elements, whereas Logup, in addition to committing to the elements that were looked up, which could be small, it also commits to inverses, which are not guaranteed to be small. Uh, so what uh, the logup GKR protocol does is uh, instead of committing to those uh, inverses, it uh, it sort of does the check that the verifier would have done by using the GKR protocol. So it avoids committing to those uh, inverses, which could be arbitrary field elements. But the end result is like this logup GKR pretty much has the same performance characteristics as um, Lasso. In some ways, they're almost the same. Uh, so baby Spartan, you could use Lasso or you could use this uh, log up GKR. I hope that answered the question. Uh, yes, thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Um, so we have another question. Uh, on the slide that you showed showing the matrices, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, someone uh, noted that this looked uh, like a direct application of the sum check protocol, where you are just checking that the left side is equal to the right side. So you are just checking that the sum of L minus R times Z equals zero. Um, and so, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. Uh, and so the question was, uh, if you could explain a bit more in detail how this relates to Lasso. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. Sorry, uh, yes, I, that makes sense. So I think, um, so there are uh, two. So on the last step on the slide that I'm showing, uh, there are two ways of proving this. One of them is, uh, uh, so so in, in Spartan, like this uh, goes back to how Spartan works. Uh, so we could run one more sum check uh, to bind these variables that I've called Y in this picture. Uh, so what happens at the end of the sum check is um, we the verifier needs to evaluate the polynomial z at random point y, which is fine because z is a dense polynomial. Though we can just call the polynomial commitment scheme to, uh, to get a, an evaluation of z, the polynomial z. But the problem is with the polynomials l and r, they are so-called sparse polynomials. So for example, we would end up 
needing to uh, query this polynomial at beta comma, uh, let's say uh, the randomness in the sum check is R Y. So we have to end up querying this polynomials L and R at beta comma R Y. Uh, so this turns out there are different ways of doing this. One of them is the naive way where the verifier evaluates this on its own. This is efficient only if the polynomial is structured. That's why for structured computations, even Spartan was able to get uh, 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 a very good cost for commitments. Uh, whereas for non unstructured computations, proving the evaluation of the sparse polynomial turns out to require random committing to random field elements because it has to commit to some EQ polynomial. Oh, sorry, commit uh, commit to uh, lookups into some EQ polynomial. Uh, so this is at the heart of the what is called the Spark com Spark commitment scheme. Whereas what uh, by what Lasso does is uh, it sort of uh, avoids making lookups into that EQ polynomial. So it it's uh, turned into lookups into the table Z itself. Uh, and if Z has small field elements, the prover commits to the looked up values, they'll also be small. Whereas mm -hmm. lo making lookups into the EQ table, EQ table will have uh, random field elements. So if uh, the prover commits to even the looked up values, which is what Spartan was doing, uh, it ends up committing to random field elements. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, we have another question, uh, and it is about whether you could go a bit more in detail on the small field optimization. Uh, so it is a general question. Yeah. So I think um, so uh, maybe uh, there is a let me go back to the earlier slide. Yeah. So uh, so uh, maybe we can focus on the uh, MSM based commitment schemes. So here we are going to repeatedly compute these exponentiations. So we have a set of bases G1 through uh, Gn, where n is the size of the polynomial that we're committing. And each of them is uh, raised to some power. And then we are going to multiply all these uh, values together. Uh, so if the exponent is, so there is a standard optimization that's used in this context called the Pippinger's algorithm. That's going to, uh, compared to naively computing these uh, exponentiations and then multiplying all of these together, Pippinger saves all like an order of magnitude or more. Uh, uh, but if the, uh, so the small scalar optimization is uh, in addition to Pippinger where if the scalars that are involved in the multi-scalar multiplication or the multi-exponentiation are smaller, then the amount of work that the prover has to do uh, for each scalar is much smaller. The main reason is it's just uh, uh, like, for example, in the simple example, if we take G, let's ignore the Pippinger because it's a single scalar, uh, it's a single exponentiation. So we just need to multiply G uh, with six, we just need to square G 16 times. So take G, compute G square and then square that value. So we just need to keep squaring 16 times to get the value of uh, G power two to the 16. Whereas for G to the two power 160, we have to do 160 such squarings. Uh, so it's it's an order of magnitude cheaper to commit to the compute the the smaller quant the, the one on the left hand, the small, the G power two to the 16 than G power two to the 160. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, we, I think that was very helpful. Yeah, it answered the question. Um, I have a question. Since you are, since you are committing to small scalars, does it mean that you are working on field extensions to reach uh, the higher security? If you want to have one hundred twenty-eight bits of security, for instance. Yeah, actually. Uh, so when using. Um... Uh, so I, I think um, it depends on the commitment scheme. For example, let's say uh, we are using uh, uh, KZG or uh, zero morph, uh, something that's based on the elliptic curve scheme. 
even though we, we are committing to small field elements, but the the for security uh, of those polynomial commitments, can we still need to work with this bigger fields? Uh, uh, so so the field operations are going to be still with the big fields, but the multi-scalar multiplication or the multi-exponentiation will be done with smaller uh, field elements. And this does not affect security at all, as long as you use the uh, the elliptic curves that are normally used for these commitment schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there are obviously like other schemes like Binius, which does not require elliptic curves. And uh, uh, one could commit to small field elements much faster than committing to big field elements. Yeah. And uh, Baby Spartan can be used with Binius as well. And yeah. there, I think for the security, you would have to use extension fields to uh, make sure the challenges are sampled from the right field to get the small soundness error. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, so you were talking about going through the paper, uh, if I remember well. So we can do that if you want. Sure. Let me pull up the paper. So do you all see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I think so. As I mentioned earlier in the paper, we end up describing this for um, uh, R1CS because it's much simpler. We are going to update this at some point to also describe for Plonkish, like I did in the talk. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I think I covered many of these things. Yeah, I think uh, one. Uh, other point which might be related to something that was asked earlier is uh, uh, the GKR lookups. We could definitely use uh, uh, any lookup argument as long as it only commits to the small field elements. I think the GKR lookup also achieves the same property as lasso. Uh, uh, so we need something called an index lookup argument. So here, uh, so there is a, uh, so in a, in a lookup argument in, in general, uh, so the, the there is a commitment to the table and there is a, a commitment to uh, uh, some values. And then we uh, just need to prove uh, that all these values in one commitment is contained in the table. Whereas here uh, by index lookup arguments, what we mean is we are, the prover is also committing to the indices at which these values show up. Like for example, let's say there's a value V and there's a table. And this value v appears at particular index i, and uh, the prover also ends up committing to those indices where this var shows up. And this is part of the statement. And this is uh, what we call an index lookup argument. And uh, as long as the lookup argument like GKR based lookup also supports this index lookup argument, they can be used inside Baby Spartan. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I think um, most of the description that I gave in the talk uh, applies to both R1CS and CCS. Uh, so let's see. I'm trying to see if there are any particular points that I want to elaborate related to the talk. Uh, Yeah, I think the main, as I uh, alluded to earlier, the main reason we, uh, the main reason uh, a Spartan ends up committing to random field elements is it has to go through this abstraction of a sparse polynomial commitment schema. So in the lasso paper, what we did was, uh, 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 if if we do not really like, if, for the purpose of proving uh, copy constraints, we don't really need this, uh, the abstraction of a sparse polynomial commitment. All we need is the abstraction of a, a lookup argument. So that's how, that's exactly how we uh, end up not having to go to the, uh, uh, not, not having to go to this uh, sparse polynomial commitment scheme and then completely avoid this random field elements. Um, 
So let's see. Yeah, so uh, so there is another question, which is, uh, can we generalize this uh, uh, baby Spartan to handle arbitrary CCS? So there is a distinction between Plonkish and CCS. So in Plonkish, if you look at, uh, uh, it only has two types of constraints, the gate constraints, which are satisfied by every row, and there is copy constraint. Uh, so these copy constraints are uh, uh, just enforcing equality between two different cells. Whereas if we look at R1CS or CCS, uh, the, linear, uh, the linear constraints are much more general. They're much more general than uh, the copy constraints. The reason is it can pretty much enforce any linear combination of values in the witness. Uh, for example, I could uh, take weighted sum of uh, uh, a bunch of witness elements and then check if it equals a particular value. This could be useful for uh, checking bit recomposition. Let's say somebody has split uh, a scalar into some bits and they want to check if the uh, bit decomposition is correct. Uh, it could be just one constraint. Whereas with Plonkish, depending on the customization done or if there is no customization done, it could have a lot of addition gates. Uh, so one question that naturally arises, uh, we describe baby Spartan for Plonkish. Can it also handle arbitrary CCS? Turns out uh, there may not be a lot of um, uh, benefit from generalization. The main reason is uh, whenever we are proving these non-uniform circuits, uh, uh, we end up paying costs proportional to the number of non-zero entries in these matrices. So if you're taking linear combinations, there's going to be many non-zero non entries for every row of the matrix. Uh, and the prover's costs end up being proportional to the number of non-zero entries. So it's it's uh, uh, the more general the general arithmetization might not actually help the prover. So in some ways, I think uh, by describing a snark for Plonkish uh, in the setting of non-uniform computation, we might get uh, we might have gotten the best possible uh, solution already. Uh, so that's one additional point that I didn't mention earlier. So to dig a dip, bit more into this uh, recent work of Diamond and Poisson, they also pretty much achieve the same property. They start with hyperplonk and use techniques from Lasso uh, to get their results. Whereas our uh, description, I think is conceptually simpler and it has uh, pretty much the same benefits uh, uh, because it also uses Lasso and Spartan instead of hyperplonk. Uh, to get a, a snark with the exact same property. And uh, the reason uh, uh, their solution seems to use hyperplonk, whereas uh, we ended up uh, starting with Spartan is because I think in their setting, they, they wanted to naturally work with multiple columns of the witness vector. But as, as I showed in, our, in the talk today, uh, uh, even baby Spartan can be described uh, uh, for such a, an arithmetization directly. So in some ways, I think uh, this this work was a a pretty uh, a straightforward combination of existing techniques, uh, and uh, we believe this is the the best way to implement uh, a snark for Plonkish constraint system. So if your circuit is going to be uh, non-uniform and it might have small field elements, I think this is the best way to get uh, the fastest prover time. Is there a benefit to folding for this? Yeah, so I think, um, so here, um, I think uh, we focus on the non-recursive proof systems. For example, you just have a circuit, you just want to produce a proof. Uh, and uh, if you have repeated copies of the same thing that you want to prove over and over, I think uh, hypernova can be sort of thought of as a, uh, a, a version of baby Spartan where it runs one sum check and then it uh, uh, just accumulates or folds all the linear constraints together. Uh, so in some way, uh, the, if you look at the folding scheme literature, there are already schemes that only pay for uh, small field. If, if your witness contains small field elements, the prover cost is already uh, small in schemes like hypernova. So if, 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 you, if you have some non-uniform computation, but you have many copies of it, 
uh, I think the best solution might be to fold all of those into one and then prove that one uh, uh, instance with baby Spartan. Thank you. Lee has hand raised. Uh, yeah, thanks for your explanation. And uh, I'm just uh, wondering what's the uh, trade off between the baby Spartan lasso and uh, related schemes? Because it looks like, I mean, uh, uh, according to my uh, shallow naive understanding, it looks like baby Spartan has no, <laughs> uh, uh, it's just uh, optimization without any uh, trade off here. So I just want to know if I misunderstand something. Sorry, what's the question? I, I, I missed the middle part of the question. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to know if there are any trade-offs when you design the baby Spartan or it's just uh, it's uh, optimization for the lasso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, mm -hmm. I think lasso was a lookup argument. So maybe let me go back to the first slide I had here. Sorry, I'm switching to the other slide yeah so so the lineage of this works is uh, uh so we had spartan which has a snark for uniform computation it, it's already good enough like it only commits to small field elements we then realized there is a lookup argument inside spartan and it ends up committing only to small field elements so that's what we described as lasso and then we described jolt which is a snark for vm executions then while designing Jolt, we realized we could go back and use Lasso inside Spartan to get this baby Spartan. So you can think of it as an optimization to Spartan using Lasso, uh, where it can also get the same property of committing to small field elements in the case of non-uniform computations, non-uniform circuits. So, so in, yes, you're right that it's an optimization uh, in the context of an existing IOP. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I feel more safe to use uh, Baby Spartan now because I mean, when I uh, considering the uh, uh, cost and everything, combination and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of trade off, I think there is uh, some knobs to play with. Uh, like, for example, uh, by uh, uh, proving, uh, let's say we focus just on Plonkish constraint systems, uh, proving both the gate checks and the copy checks together and then making some choices inside lasso to reduce proof sizes i think there are a bunch of knobs around proof sizes uh, and amount of communication uh, amount of communication and the verified cost like there's some trade off there uh, thank you very much Nic nicolas uh, yes hi uh, thanks for the for the talk uh, just a quick question back on the folding i i think i understood what you said but just want to confirm can you, uh, we can use baby Spartan as a final uh, decider at the end of the folding step, right? So it yeah. will improve uh, directly from Spartan because for the, well, I'm just talking about the R1CS because it's simpler in this way, but for the R1CS matrix, we can use Lasso instead of the one that was natively in Spartan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there is a, uh, so in, in the NOVA code base, uh, there are two implementations of the SNARK. One of mm -hmm. them is called snark.rs, which is based on Spartan uh, and does not use this pre-processing. It, it sort of targets more uniform circuits. Uh, whereas the uh, there is another implementation called pp-snark. We haven't described that formally in any paper yet, but it's it can be thought of as baby Spartan, where it's using lookup arguments inside. Uh, but right now, uh, because of our circuits are highly uh, they're not Plonkish, they're R1CS, and there are multiple non zero like in, in this uh, copy constraints, right? Like in the slide 17 that I showed, these matrices L and R, they can have only one non zero entry per row. Whereas in a general R1CS, there can be more than one non zero entry. So it ends up achieving something similar to baby Spartan, except there is one, uh, one place where it, it does end up committing to random field elements. But I think if we rewrite those constraint systems so that uh, there's only one fear, one uh, entry, one non-zero entry per row of the matrix, uh, 
uh, we can we basically get the benefit of uh, baby Spartan with uh, what is called PP snark inside our code base. I see. And for so for general CCS, uh, we can use baby Spartan as a final decider. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes exactly. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I don't see any other question, so I think we are good. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming today. And that was a really interesting talk. Uh, I will have to have a look at the at the repository later on. Uh, it seems very interesting. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot again for coming. I hope to see you here late, uh, one, in the future. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please reach out. Yeah. Uh, if Thank anyone you. has any question, you can also reach me out and I can uh, send to, to you afterwards. That's no problem at all. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.